Hello everyone and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. I'm delighted to welcome as today's presenter Karen Elliott. Karen has worked teaching English for more than 20 years in many different countries. Um, she's taught English as a foreign language at the British Council in Bilbao, where she's um, also a teacher trainer. She's especially interested in topic and story-based learning and encouraging learner autonomy and learning through synthetic, synthetic phonics. She works on a variety of projects as a consultant with different schools and writes for Cambridge University Press. So, over to you, Karen. Thank you, Alistair, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's, um, it's very nice to be here. I'm in Spain, in Bilbao, as Alistair said. And how do I sound? Am I the right volume? Yeah, that, that's, that's great, Karen. Okay, Thanks. Great. So, first of all, welcome to the Phonics webinar. Uh, this webinar is mainly for infants and primary teachers, but it is useful for everyone. Uh, the aim of the web webinar is to demonstrate the phonics process while providing activities that you can use in the classroom. And please contribute with your questions and ideas in the chat box. We have a few moments where I will answer some questions, but I'll be keeping track of the time. So there'll be, uh, if, if, if I can't answer your questions, hopefully you can ask them again at the end if they're very important and they haven't been answered. Um, so, some common questions about phonics. Um, what is it, which we're going to look at briefly and then go into more detail through activities. And why do we teach phonics in English as a foreign language? Do I have to be a native speaker? I'm going to answer this one right now because I get asked this a lot. And the answer is you certainly do not have to be a native speaker. It's uh, phonics is the study of the, of the language in a certain way and anyone will benefit from understanding and using the method. And how do I teach it? So we're going to have a look at that, of course. And another thing that people often ask is about tricky words. And don't be afraid of tricky words. We're going to have a look at them at the end. So phonics is the relationship between the spoken and written language. The spoken language is a series of phonemes and the written language is a series of symbols. It is All of this is in the alphabetic code, which is the key to understanding phonics. And the alphabetic code sets out the letters and the sounds that go with them and the sound spelling patterns of the English language. All right, and then there are some things that actually fall out, some words that fall out of this pattern and they need to be learned separately. We teach phonics in steps or phases and today we're going to start by looking at phase one and moving on up to phase three phonics. And the most important thing for you to know about phonics is that it is best learned as you go along. So as you teach your students, as you as you have fun with them and play games, uh, each step of the way will become clearer to you and more enjoyable and easier to use the second time around. Okay, so phase one phonics. This is the, the phonics that we, we teach when we don't actually show our students the written language we're looking at sounds, it's the percussion, it's the beat, it's whether a sound is loud or soft, long or short. And as a child, one of the things that um, we learn first in our own language, even before we understand actual words, is how sounds are interpreted by our language. So here are some pictures of, um, sounds. Can you work out what they are? Perhaps you'd like to write in the chat box what you think. We're looking at onomatopoeic words to represent these different pictures. So the first one, what do you think it might be? How's that? Clap. All right, what about the next one? 
crunch, knock, splash. Okay, we have two animals here. What do animals say in English? It might be the same as in your language or it might be different. A cow says moo in English and a mouse says squeak. Okay, um, so we can learn a lot about the language. In your own language, these onomatopoeic words will probably be different, even though the sounds are the same, because we interpret the sounds through the phonemes of our own language. There are a lot of interesting things that uh, we can learn by looking at onomatopoeic words, and you will see, for example, that the short vowel sounds here are represented with one letter, clap, crunch, knock, splash, whereas the long vowel sounds are represented by two letters together. Another thing that we notice is that we have friendly letters that like each other, like the L and the R, which often join with other consonants to form these consonant blends, clap, crunch. And here we've got a triple blend, which you may not have in your language. And this is the spl, okay, as in splash. And here we have another one, squ, as in squeak. Okay, another thing you'll notice is that here we have got in knock, we have two letters that represent one phoneme, the n sound, and k, two letters again, which represent one phoneme. So you can see how the symbols and the sounds are related and uh well i think we can move on i usually do this in front of a crowd and everybody's shouting out the answers so it seems a bit strange to be doing it without hearing anyone speaking but i'm sure you get the idea so how does this apply to our very very young learners i'm sure you all know the famous story where's my mummy um uh, when the little chick crack comes out of the egg and pops out and she's very hungry and she's looking all around and suddenly she sees a dog and she says cheep cheep are you my mummy and of course the dog will say woof woof no i'm not your mummy so the chick goes along and speaks to the next animal that she sees which is a cat who of course says meow no, I'm not your mummy. When she goes to see the mouse, it's squeak, squeak. And the duck, quack, quack. Usually at this stage, my students think that their little chick has found her mummy. So that's quite nice because, of course, she hasn't. And um, we have here, what does a pig say? Oink, oink. And a sheep, ba. And a cow says, moo. And, of course, none of them are mummy. But here, can you hear? Cluck, 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 cluck. Here she is. Here's mummy. And she's brought our little chick some lovely, yummy worms. So with a story like this, when you're working with very young children, through the sounds, you're actually teaching them the phonemes of the language. So it's very, very important that we are replicating here what young children learn in their own language. And in our classes, it's um, a very, very important thing that we actually use the onomatopoeic words of English when we're, when we're using these kinds of stories. And also that we do use these kinds of stories and we ask the children to repeat these sounds so that they're internalizing the phonemes. A game you can play here at circle time is to put up all the animals and ask a child to come to the front and look at the pictures and then you choose somebody in the room to make one of the sounds for example Anna is going to has decided to be the cat and she'll say meow and the child who's facing the pictures has to try and work out who it is that's made the sound and if she's right then the other child comes up and is the next person to guess so the one kind of activity that you can use with very young children to help them to uh, hear the phonemes of the English language. What do we model for our early language learners before they even see the, the actual letters, the symbols of the written language? 
we, re we, we help them to recognize that sounds can be long or short. They can be voiced or unvoiced. We blend sounds to make words. And when we read, sounds are represented by symbols. So even if they actually don't know what the symbols are yet, they recognize the relationship. Okay, so this is phase one phonics. Um, does anyone have any questions at this stage? One question, um, Karen, from Christine that um, might, I don't know if you want to take it now, it's about whether you would teach phonics differently to L2 learners than to native L1 learners. Would you like to answer that now or save um, that for later? Yes, certainly at this stage there would be no difference. As you can see, it's the same the same way that you would um, teach any small child. Um, the thing about phonics is that it is not separate from the language. Okay, it's just it's the study of the language from the point of view that the spoken and written language are very very closely related. So um, I would say that there are some differences and I, I, I actually did want to answer this question at another stage, but I'm going to answer it here because I think it's actually quite important to recognize that um, there is really in EFL going to be huge strides in the way that we teach phonics in the future. We are going to make it our own. It's going to be probably uh, different um, than the way it's taught in schools to native native students. At the moment, we've taken all the information and all the books and we're, we're following this, but um, already there are huge exciting developments in, in EFL in terms of teaching phonics specifically to non-native children and everyone. In fact, you don't have to be a child to learn a lot about uh, pronunciation and literacy with phonics. Thanks. Um, we've got a, a couple of people asking um, what, um, when do you start teaching um, phase one? How old are the students when you're? Phase one is uh, the minute they come into your classroom. It, they might be two. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. It's uh, phase one phonics is exactly what a mother or father does when they're speaking to their child. They exaggerate the phonemes of the language. They, the, if the child is um, playing with a car and is going broom, 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 for example, they're actually choosing to use the phonemes to make a sound. Um, you know, all this, all this work with like when, when you are doing a story and someone's knocking at the door, for example, if you say the word knock, 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 you are doing it differently than you would do in another language. And they're learning so much information about the way the language works and also about the phonemes of the language. OK, thanks. Um, we've got time for one more question or one should we go on? One more question and then we'll move on to phase two. OK. Um, Christine Sotor Chandley asked if you could define um, the difference between voiced and unvoiced. Ah, so. yes, good question. That will come up, actually. Ah, but um, a voiced consonant is one which, um, well, we talk about um, consonants in terms of pairs. And if you look at your phonemic chart, you'll see, for example, that the b sound and the p sound, the, the manner of articulation, the way your lips are formed and and the, the explosion of the air is the same but the difference is that one has the voice added to it the b as in bat compared to p as in pen does that answer the question i, I think so thanks very much shall we move on yes okay. okay phase two phonics is when we start to talk about letter sounds we ask our students to put a sound, a phoneme, to a letter, and this is called a letter sound. Okay, we use these letter sounds to blend them so that we can read words. And for teachers at this stage, it's very important that uh, you know and understand the alphabetic code. And at this stage, we also need to teach some tricky words especially so that students recognize this concept of tricky words so that when they're trying to blend to read a word if they're not 
pronouncing it correctly, they realize that it's not them, it's the language. There are still things that they need to learn. So we can always say to a child, ah, that's a tricky word when they try to, to read a word that they're unable to. Um, the alphabetic code, if you, I'm going to show it to you in a minute, but if you go to the blog article, you can click on a link and you'll be able to down, download your own copies if you haven't got any. There are several different ones uh, floating around in the world, um, but uh, I've put together one that I hope you will find useful. Okay, some common questions. Okay, what is a letter sound? I don't know if I've answered that, but we're going to look at that more carefully. Okay, which letter sounds do I teach first and why? How do I introduce the letter sounds? And what are tricky words and how do I teach them? So in this next, in the rest of the uh, of the webinar, I hope that I answer these questions, but if you feel as if they haven't been answered to, or you don't understand anything, please do ask at any time during our question times. So let's have a look at the alphabetic code here. These are the consonants with major alternative spellings. So I'll just get my pointer here, and you can see if we look at B, do you remember I said that here we have the the voiced consonant and the pair, the unvoiced one is the p, p, which means the manner of articulation is the same for these two. You can see that also with k, k and g, that's another pair. We've got our d, d and t. A very interesting one here, which doesn't exist in some languages, is the j, j in jam, which is the voiced consonant for the ch, ch sound, as in chips. Okay, why it's very important to point these things out now is that when you study the um, consonant um, alphabetic code, you will be able to decide if in some cases you have one of the voiced or unvoiced consonants, but not the other, because it's a very good way to teach your students. For example, in Spain, we have the ch, ch sound, but the j sound is missing. But I know that they have the right manner of articulation, so I can use this and I can tell them to voice it uh, to, to get this other sound. You'll have to um, study the alphabetic code and work out which consonants are missing, and then you'll be able to use this in some cases. We have another one, for example, the and the z, you will see in perhaps in, in your language, one of these is missing. So the idea is that by recognizing and using a letter to represent a phoneme, you can provide students with words that then they're able to pronounce using that recognition of a particular letter that goes with the phoneme. You can see here, of course, some very other uh, some other things. For example, the doubled consonants are always exactly the same. It's the same frame. You can see here our very first alternative spelling. All right, we've got the k as in cat, the k as in kick. So c and k are alternative spellings for the same phoneme. And then we have what we call a digraph. You can see here the um, combination of two letters, which actually still gives us the same phoneme, the k phoneme. So this is the kind of information that you will find in the alphabetic code. Here we have the f phoneme, and look at the digraph here, the ph, which gives us the same sound, and it, we use it in elephant, but also phone and phonics, for example. Um, if you look through, you will see several of these. So that's what the alphabetic code is. It's um, the, um, the, a chart showing the alternative spellings for the same sound. 
So, well, let's move on. How do we actually, you can see how many consonants there are in the English language here, consonant phonemes, which I'm going to call letter sounds from now on. Um, you can see how many letter sounds we've got. So how do we help our students to remember them, especially when they're probably starting to learn this information when they're five or six? So one way is we, we try and reference um, the, the consonants or the letter sounds, sorry. We try and reference the letter sounds so that we can repeat them again and again. We, if you follow any methods, uh, you will know that they often use gestures and songs and stories, which are all the kinds of things. Simply the idea is to place this information in the head where it can be referenced and, and pulled out regularly until the information is automatic within the child. So here we've got Sammy's, the snake loves sleeping in the sun, for example. Uh, Gertie Goats got a gorgeous gown. Harry the horse loves to do housework. So I think he's actually happy doing housework, isn't he? So you can see that by doing this, we, uh, we have a reference that our students can, can relate to. Um, so it's very, very important to, especially when you're first teaching children, to realize that it's not easy for them to remember the, le the letter sound, the, that is, the, the letter and the phoneme that goes with it. So we need to work, um, work on this. Um, for example, here we've got the first one that we usually do is because there's, it, it, it's such a, a simple um, shape for one, re for, for one thing. It's in lots of words. And as you can see, this is a phonics wall um, in a children's classroom. And you can see some of the words that students um, are learning. Stop, sun, seeds. In fact, there's sunflower seeds and there's a skirt. So the idea is in your room, you could have whatever sound, letter sound you're learning. You could put up some pictures to go with it. And that's one way of helping the students to recognize the, the sound at the beginning of words, which is where we start. Mm, what I found incredibly interesting about this is how my students through this actually remember more vocabulary. They remember words a lot, um, a lot easier by recognizing or remembering the first sound, the first letter in that word. A game that I play with my students that they really like is to put a whole lot of objects in a bag and one child comes to the front and sticks their hands in the bag and with their eyes closed they feel the object and they hold it up so that the other students can see it and the other students can only say the first letter or the, 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 the letter sound, the initial letter sound. So for example if the child pulls out one of these objects, the children might say d, 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 and of course then that helps the child to realize that it's actually a dog. So I've had a lot of fun playing that game with my students and again here we're looking at initial letter, letter sounds and you can hold up the letter sound at the same time if you want to give them extra extra practice. What comes next? We spend a lot of time working with the initial letter sounds and of course um, consonants are great for this. There are a lot more words that start with consonants. But when we're blending, we need to stick in those vowel sounds. So this is where I'm going to show you for the first time the uh, alphabetic code for the vowels with the major alternative spellings. You can see there are far too many for a very young child to learn all at once, which is why phonics is a process. We tend to, t well, we don't tend, we teach the first five vowel sounds to start with. And we're looking at the a, e, e, o, and a letter sounds. And so let's just look at the process quickly through three slides. Here we've got what I might first do with my students, where I give them pictures or drawings and little cards with the, with the initial letter sounds. So here we've got the e in egg, 
in hats, sun, b, bed, k, cup. So if you've got an IWB, an interactive whiteboard, it's fantastic because you can ask them to drag them across. Um, and then we move on and we could have little cards around the room or whatever or on the tables and children's now have to match the initial sound to the simple word. These are simple decodable words. So we've got b as in bed and then they can match. They already know the b in bed and then they match the initial letter sound, the decodable word with the picture. Um, so then I would take away that initial letter sound and now the children are reading words which they find incredibly exciting. Um, and again, this is a very lovely thing if you're able to do it on an interactive whiteboard, but also if you don't mind having little pieces of paper. Um, it's, uh, phonics works really well as a warmer at the beginning of the class and sometimes I'll just have a picture on the table with a series of laminated words like this and the children come in and they they have to match the words to the pictures and then show me and then we can move on to do something else. So that's um, an initial activity. Another one, once they've mastered say 20 or so of these um, deco simple decodable words, you can play bingo, which they absolutely love. So let's try and make phonics fun and exciting. You can see here are two different um, um, bingo boards. It, you, they could play it in teams or pairs, or you might want to give them individual ones. You can make a set of these and laminate them, which is why I've shown it to you like this, because here you can see these little pieces of card. The children uh, each have their, their cards, and then you have an envelope, and in the envelope are the words. I often put the words and the picture with the picture next to it in the card, so that even children who are not reading yet are able to put their hands into the bag and, and say the word. And so you can see the first word to be pulled out was sun, and, and both teams have, have got a point. And in the next one, we've got ant, and now team one is in front. So that's um, a fun way to make um, this process enjoyable and it's also very interesting how much you can see about which children are blending and which ones are still having trouble at this stage through games like this. Okay, another game that you can play um, is, well, this is a really important, I'd, I'd like to just stop here. This is how many words can you make? Now, some people ask, why don't we teach the letters of the alphabet in order? Um, perhaps if you know the answer, you can write it now in the chat box. Because here we have got um, the five vowel sounds, um, which vowel letter sounds, which are very, very important for making these decodable words but we've only got uh, nine of the consonant sounds and these are some very, very common ones and we've actually chosen them and they are used because we can make so many words with them. And just to give you an example, very quickly there we've got cat, bed and sun and there's other words there as well, of course. You can immediately see pot, him, um, net, um, bad, mat, pet, and so on. So this is why we don't teach the letters in alphabetical order. Although with older children, I see nothing wrong with that because they already um, have that information. So a game we can play with these, if you have your children in uh, at, sitting at different tables, you can give them these little cards and you ask them to make words, you read out the words and each team gets a point for the words that they make correctly and at the end the team who first realizes that you've got you've gone back to the original word and calls out full circle gets an extra point. So for example the first word I call out is cat 
and if they're very young and they're still not blending properly you could say k at cat for example and the children look through their their letter sounds and they make the word and then you have the next one but at bed sun ten hat wait for it cat full circle so using just uh, these this number of letters you can make uh, loads and loads of words so as long as you choose your letters carefully you can play this game at the end of a class for several weeks even um, choosing different different words and um, it's just fun but it's also giving them the sounds of English in Spain we have a lot of trouble with the um, a and a uh sound so they're often writing cut instead of cat and butt instead of bat and bus and bus and so it's it's really useful to help that to, to for the repetition for them to hear the sounds that might be missing in their language mm, so what next all right the next thing that we need to realize is that initial blends are very important so you can see that there's some letters that are really friendly and the r letter sound and the l one are two of these very very friendly letters they like to they like to uh, join up with other consonants to make um, these initial blends so if we say to a child b r e d it's very hard for them to hear the word bread so we need to actually recognize that when we're blending initial with initial blends we need to say the two together so you might want to practice this at home right now it's br dr fr gr bl cl fl pl so once i've taught these then i would um, move on to triple blends which are much more difficult for students and in some countries where they don't exist they find it very difficult to say them and you can see here we've got squ, spl, spr and str. So a game you can play um, with these um, blends is for example just on your whiteboard you can just write the first four boxes there br, dr, pr, gr and as a warmer one day the students have to try and think of as many words they can with this with with these combinations so i'm sure you can immediately think of some for example we've got anyone want to write anything in the chat box i don't know we've got brown bring draw drink frog green and so on and then if you play it as a team game you simply count up all the different words and if they're spelled correctly they get a point and then you can do the next one another day and the next one another day so here are some examples of answers that you might get okay so now um we let me see oh yes now you can ask questions and we're doing very well for time by the way i probably just want to push on a bit so that we we don't fall back but i would be very happy to answer a few questions now okay so we've got a question from um christine who asks what do you suggest when some children can't pronounce some of the sounds that you teach Okay, well, that's actually the whole point. Uh, well, there, there, there are two issues here. Why can't the child pronounce it? Um, some children may have problems because of some sort of muscular thing or whatever. So this is obviously not the issue we're dealing with here right now, where these children probably need extra help, um, but they will also have problems in their own language. I imagine you're speaking about children who have trouble pronouncing English phonemes because they don't exist in their language. Um, in that case, this is the whole point of phonics for EFL. By isolating every single phoneme and attaching it to a letter sound, 
we're giving them a reference to a phoneme that they may not have even heard before and it also also means that they stop putting if they have a um, if their language is also written in a Roman language uh, they often tend to substitute their own pronunciation, their own phoneme for the English one. So this is the habit that we're breaking. This is what we're doing through creating this referencing and rep repetition. And by making every phoneme concrete, by giving it a symbol that the children can practice, um, practice saying it with, and they can keep seeing the this um, the same letter sound in several different words until they can actually recognize and hear the sound and pronounce it. Okay, thanks. Um, I had a few questions about phonetic symbols and whether you'd teach primary children these and, and if so, at what, um, what age and how. Um, would you would you introduce them to phonetic symbols? I wouldn't mix phonetic symbols with phonics. Um, they're, but phonetics is absolutely fantastic, of course, but it's the international um, reference. And this is something for um, um, later, all right? Phonics is uh, something that allows children to immediately understand the phonemes, the letter sounds of the language, put them together to read words. So, no, I wouldn't introduce uh, the phonetic script to primary children. Okay, thanks. Shall um, we move on? Shall we move Unless on? Yeah. you have a question directly related to phase two phonics there. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yep, please. Okay. Thank you. So, phase three phonics, we go um, into the digraphs and trigraphs and the split digraphs more alternative spellings and more tricky words and so as so I were going to use this as an example here we have our chickens in the kitchen the chickens are cooking in the kitchen and you will see here we've got a digraph here we go digraph for this phoneme which cannot be represented with a single letter and we also have what is called a trigraph. You can see here the TCH, as in kitchen and match and which, uh, are all uh, is exactly the same phoneme as the, the the digraph here. So children do need to learn that sometimes a letter a phoneme can only be pronounced by combining uh, two letters and that there are also three letters that make one sound. The most important thing here is that this is actually very, very important when we're working with the vowels. And you see here we have so many vowel sounds in English. We've got our a, a, e, a, a, short vowel sounds. We have two more short vowel sounds, the u uh sound and the e uh sound, the famous schwa. So um, besides these, we have got all these lovely long vowel sounds, A, E, I, O, U, OI, OW, U, A, O, U. One of these is not strictly, you'll see here, this is not strictly a phoneme, it's the U, U sound, but we teach it because you will notice something interesting here. A, E, I, O, and U are the names of these letters of the alphabet. It's very, very useful that they're able to, for when they, when they have to learn to spell, um, that they actually know how to pronounce these phonemes. Not only that, of course, um, the U has a particular spelling which often, as you can see here in U, is sometimes the same, but we also have a separate spelling here for the U phoneme without the Y sound in front of it. Um, but to get back to basics here, let's just have a look. You can see here rain. This is the first, the digraph that we teach first for this sound, A. We can make a lovely rain gesture, A as in rain. And then we've got at the end of words, 
A with the Y at the end. And then what we have here is called the split digraph. Children need to learn that we sometimes separate um, these two, two letters that make a long vowel sound and we put a consonant between them in order to, but, but, but the sound is still the same. Um, what else is important here? So much. You'll really need, because we haven't got all that much time, to look at, the, look at this and see what's really important for you in your language, which vowel sounds don't exist. Um, and then, of course, let's take a look at a few little other things. For example, here we've got the trigraph, I-G-H, as in light and right and bright. And once children learn about this trigraph, of course, you can stop them thinking that it's ricket. Um, and uh, it makes it a lot easier for them to recognize the spelling pattern. Um, something else which is very important to recognize is that sometimes we have, as you can see here, the O phoneme is sometimes written O-W as in yellow. But sometimes um, what a digraph or, uh, can be used uh, for a different phoneme. So here we've got the owl as in brown. Some people at this point think, well, that's very difficult. But in fact, it can't, the, these two, uh, the, this digraph here can't represent many other sounds. So it's actually once you've isolated it and then you do some work with your students, um, then they recognize that it has to be one of two sounds, which is better than having to um, wonder what on earth, uh, you know, how this, how this word is, is pronounced. Okay. Um, as I said, we've got here A-E-I-O-U. These are the ones that we tend to teach first. I actually tend to teach U and U together because it gives us so many more words to, to play with. And another very, very important one is working with the ER sound because the this long ER sound is so common in English. But not only that, not only do we use it when we're, when we're trying to work out what to say next, when we say ER, but we shorten it and we make this schwa. And so we can actually, it's a wonderful thing to be able to concretely show our students how to make the schwa. So in words like sister, brother, mother, father, it is simply this short sound, uh, this, this long er sound shortened. Let's move on and look at ways to actually make this information clear to our students and to practice it with them in games. So you can see one way is to ask our students to recognize and to hear the phonemes in the words. So here's um, the three phonemes in er, a, n, and four phonemes in train, t, er, a, n, train. So uh, we can ask our students to put these, put the phonemes, uh, put the words into the boxes according to um, the number of phonemes. So you can see, I'm sure everyone can see that the first word, cat, k, at, has three phonemes. But it's very important to recognize that so does the second one, er, a, n. So let's just have a look at this information if we put it in here. Just take a little look at that because it'll help you um, to, because you'll need to be looking at the phonemes within words as well, recognizing the spelling patterns that go with them. And if we look at, uh, if we take song as an example, you can see s, o, Mm. Okay, so here the n mm is a phoneme that can only be represented with two letters there, with the digraph. Okay, so the trick is to recognize where a digraph is actually one sound. And your students can get very good at this if you give them practice. 
Okay, we're going to now look at some examples of long vowel sounds and ways that you can practice them with your students. And the E sound, as in C, tree, B, week, also the alternative spelling, read, team, see, eat, and the split digraph, these, theme, and seem. Just to give you examples, of course, some of these words you may not use with your students, but we are working all the way through primary. So at the end of primary, probably children will have seen all of these words. Um, so a game that I play, which my students really like, is a running dictation with a gap text. So the students are in teams and the students have uh, a paper here with the E sound and you can see it's a gapped text. Then on the wall I put here the, uh, the words with the E sound in them that need to fit into this gap text. So you can see Pete is there so that the children have something to, to reference and, and to recognize what they're going to do. So you can play it in pairs or you can play it uh, in groups and one child runs up to the front and they find the word that's going to go into the, uh, the gap. So let's have a look at a finished example of this game. He likes the beach. He can swim in the sea. He can eat ice cream and read. Oops, read should be blue. Okay, I don't know what's happened there. Okay, and sleep under a tree. Pete likes the beach. Okay, so you will notice here that the he is the tricky word. All right, we need to teach children that the pronunciation is the same as in eat and cream and sleep. So you can play this game, of course, with um, any alternative spellings, any long vowel sounds. Um, what we're going to look now at is the A sound. Say, day, play, may, rain, train, tail, wait, name, game, cake, plane. So again, you can see the alternative spellings for this phoneme here. And sometimes you can just do this as a dictation if you want, but um, you can see here there's a whole lot of simple sentences and the students have to try and guess what goes into the gaps. Or like I say, if you do it as a dictation, you can put them all in and then put it up on the board and ask students to check their answers and check their spelling. And then you can go through all the alternative spellings. With older students, when I want them to compare phonemes, I might play that running gap fill game that I showed you earlier with Pete likes the beach here. But I might combine two phonemes. As you can see here on the same paper, we have two. And the students take it in terms to run and try and find the words that fit. Okay into the gaps and it's very interesting for them because if they're not phonemes that exist in their language they will find this very difficult so it really helps them to recognize the different phonemes at the same time as they're learning the alternative spellings of course we're going into higher primary now this is probably for primary five and six uh, another thing that you can do and again because we're moving into higher primary um, is you can ask them a load of questions and I've chosen the er letter sound so you can see the kind of information that students need. I wouldn't ask five questions but uh, probably three or four questions that I would put on the board and for example we've got is your birthday on the first, third, 21st or 23rd day of the month? Are you an early bird? Would you prefer to work as a nurse or a journalist? How many girls in the class are wearing skirts? Write some new words you learned this term. Okay, so here we have, we ask the students if they can find the er sound in these words. Okay, and you can see that we have alternative spelling, er with I-R. Here we have our main spelling that we teach. And then we have got other alternative spellings here and here. 
Okay, but we also have some tricky words, work, journalist, all right? So when we combine them like this and we put all the words together, we're helping our students to recognize that tricky words and uh, the, the, the tricky words that have the same pronunciation as the words that they're learning. Then I would just ask them to answer the questions and we'd have a discussion in class. It makes a really nice warmer. Okay, um, so here we've got another game. This is the same game that we played at first, but now I just want to play this so you can see how students learn to recognize split digraphs. So here you can see um, in their groups, you, you would give them these little cards and you ask them to, uh, the first word might be train. So they look through all the cards and they, they make train. Okay, and then look at this, plain. They have to take away the A and they have to substitute it here for the split digraph. So then that's, you know, this is, this is a way to help them to recognize that. And then um, some children will need help with this, of course. Then we go on to name, home, mine, train, and we've come full circle. So if you play this game, then uh, the team that recognizes that they've come full circle can get an extra point. Um, so that's just another game. And the reason I've finished on the A is because we're moving into tricky words next. Um, because we've only got 10 minutes left, can you, do, if you have any very important questions about this, please can you write it down on a piece of paper and we'll come back to it because I'd really like to go on to tricky words to make sure that we answer a very important question. Okay, so you've been teaching your students all about um, A's, E's, I's, O's, U's, or O's, and, and O's, and of course all these tricky words are coming up. Let's use A as an example. Here we've got they, gray, hay, eight, straight, wait, and great, break, and steak. So students have to be able to recognize that these are tricky words with your help. And then, of course, you need to somehow find ways of helping them to remember how they're pronounced. So the first thing you can say is, how should it sound? Look at this word. What's wrong with this word? We'd say, look, surely it should be pronounced one, but it's not because it's a tricky word. So this is one way of getting them to recognize it. So then we've got drilling and repetition. Most children, because they've learned one, two, three, four, since they were very young children, as soon as they say one, they say it correctly because of all of this uh, repetition of this particular um, tricky word that they've had since they were very young. But if it's a new word, you may need to uh, to say, it, for example, straight, straight. All right, and then what is this word straight, as in I've got straight hair. What word does it sound like? Well, it sounds like today and make, and it actually rhymes with late and gate. So you can see that we, we, we use this kind of information. And as you can see here, one rhymes with, here we have a decodable word. So we can help our very little ones um, straight away when they see that word. One rhymes with sun, shoe rhymes with zoo, and keys rhyme with peas. So this is the kind of thing that we, we do, but you may want to give them more help. And here's a quick warmer that you could play. Um, each one of these games, you would only play one game at the beginning of a class. And you can see here, you would have to make some sort of a, a little table or you could put it on the board that when the student throws a one, they get to tick off the I. If they throw a two, they can tick off the me. If they throw a three, they can tick off the we. If they get a four, they can tick off the. And five is a you. And six, they can tick off do. So the first person to throw all the letters, uh, sorry, all the numbers of the, of the dice will be the ones who are the winners. 
Um, just to show you how it works, for example, this student has thrown a three so they can tick off we. But as they're doing this, of course, they have to keep re repeating and repeating and the children uh, who haven't got this yet will then have to repeat it. And so they'll be hearing the pronunciation of these tricky words as they're reading them again and again. Six, do, another tricky word. And now this student has got two and they need to get four more to be the winners of that round in the game. So that's one possibility. And as you can see, then perhaps in the next class, you might play with these words and or the week after. And then you can see here are some more tricky words uh, for a bit later on that are a bit more difficult for some students. OK, now here's um, Here's something that I wanted to do with you just because we do so much poetry when we're learning English and it's one of the ways that we recognize tricky words um, because we, we hear all these poems and words that rhyme and we learn it, it quite naturally and it needs it's something that we probably need to do a bit more with our students. And you can see here, this is the uh sound, as in London. So when you come to a tricky word which has the uh sound, you can say to them, ah, this word has the uh sound like London. And here we have a poem. My cousin from London is young and funny. She loves the sun and running and jumping, but she doesn't like studying or spending money. So we could say this poem several times as a class while they're reading it so that they can recognize all these different spellings of the a uh sound, as in London. And then you could ask them to try to put the poem back together from the initial letter sounds. So you can see here that I've given help with, for example, the sh. My cousin from London is young and funny. She loves the sun and running and jumping, but she doesn't like studying or spending money. So it's just another way of tricking students into saying um, tricky words and recognizing the, the spelling, as you can see, of some of those words which they're probably not pronouncing correctly at the moment. And well, that is the end of the webinar. And we just have a few minutes for any questions that you'd like to ask. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, yes, so we've got time for a few questions. So um, let's have a look. Uh, I've got quite a few come in um, during the course of the of the talk. Um, let's let's. Uh, uh, Maria Pavlou asks if you can suggest a particular book for um, phonics that covers what you've been, been looking at. Mm, um, well, there are several, several methods, um, uh, and it depends on the age. So uh, one of the issues that we have at the moment is that in EFL, we don't really have that many straight out phonics books with the kind of language. For example, in, in the native language, we have so many more uh, words that we can use which are less relevant for our students. But of course, if you just go online and you put in um, phonics, you, you, you'll find hundreds of workbooks. I also like to use stories. Um, so, so yes, there, there, there's a lot of information at the moment off the top of my head. I'm afraid I can't really recommend any book in particular. Okay, thanks. I mean, um, new course books, the, C, the, the, the Cambridge course books, of course, all the primary course books now have phonics in them. But a specific um, book, I'll, I'll have to think about that. Thanks. A question about uh, silent letters. Um, uh, what what eight stage do you recommend teaching those? Well, silent words with silent letters will come up where they come up in the topic that you're teaching, and they if they have a silent letter in them, that makes them a tricky word. So I would try to find a way of teaching them that to show, uh, you know, like. 
for example, when they have to start reading the word listen, and there's that lovely silent T in there, as in there's listen and castle and whistle and you know, so I might make a point of highlighting the fact that in that, that, that there are these words that have this silent letter, and I would say, yes, this is a tricky word. Um, well, uh, okay, maybe another question. Okay, I hope thanks. that answered. That um, one. Question from Maxilan Bahada Perath, who asks um, how you'd explain the the different sounds um, for th for for th rather. Ah, th. Okay. Well, first of all, here we go back to our voiced and unvoiced consonant. So we've got a th, th. Everything is the same except for that one's got a voice and one hasn't. So I would use this concept. Um, and then if you if you dictate some sentences, uh, I can't think of any off the head. Let me off off the top of my head. The thirsty. The thirsty mother thinks whatever. I would dictate a sentence like this, and then I would ask my students to color the unvoiced consonant, for example, in blue, and the voiced consonant in red. That's one idea. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you very much, Karen, for another absolutely fascinating session with lots of wonderful ideas and. Um, just remind everybody that um, Karen's written a blog post for us um, about phonics, which also contains a lot of uh, a lot of really useful uh, ideas and information, and also a link to the alphabetic code. So I've just pasted that into the chat. Um, also, I should let you know that we've got some new webinars coming up. They're so new that they're not actually listed on our website yet. But because you've attended today, we can let you know um, ahead of time what they're going to be. So I've just pasted those into the chat. We've got um, Craig Thane on June the 16th, in, uh, that's in just three weeks' time. That's going to be six hours earlier, so in the morning in the UK. And that's on second language acquisition and manageable learning. Then the following week at the normal time, we have Teresa Clementson on effortless fluency for your high-level learners. And the day after that, I just see I put the link in slightly incorrectly there. And the day after that, on June the 24th, you'll have another chance to um, hear Adrian Doff do his talk on more than speaking and um, developing student speaking skills because we had a problem when we recorded that and so the recording of that's not been available on the website but um, that's on June the 24th which is a Wednesday at three o'clock the usual time so there are links to those um, in the in the chat we'll um, we'll paste um, Chris, uh, Charlotte is very very helpfully pasting those into the into the chat right now so thank you everyone for attending. Certificates will be sent out automatically later this week, probably on Friday this week. And um, thank you very much, Karen, for another really interesting webinar. Thanks, Karen. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it, and I hope everyone did too. And Great. Thanks then. Bye everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.